So one of the shows that I was most anticipating for this new winter season, and I'm sure this is true for almost everybody else too, is the new weekly shonen jump hit, Aksoku no Neverland. You may have heard of it. Now going into this first episode, I really didn't know too much about this series, other than things were supposedly going to get dark, as I heard this first arc was amazing, and clearly the best of the entire series. So I guess you could say that this looked at least rather promising. No? Okay, sorry. We begin with our heroine, wake up to the sound of bells chiming. Emma, aka female Hinata, is described as the most energetic of the bunch. As rambunctious as any 5 year old, despite her being already considered close to an old hag at 11. And Japan just likes them younger and younger every single year, don't they? But that's not enough to stop our shonen heroine from still getting her game on. If you know what I mean, of course. We're introduced to what looks to be the other two main characters, who are both geniuses because hey, this is a super high IQ show. Could you do these complex things like putting together picture puzzles? Yeah, I didn't think so, bud. These fried kids train their superior intellect every single day by scanning bar <laughs> barcodes. Obviously, they prepare for their future high profile career as a cash register worker at the grocery store. What? No? They are the groceries? So that's the twist? Okay then. So a lot of things in this series feels very similar to Attack on Titan, at least conceptually, so far. With the whole being pinned up as livestock surrounded by man-eating monsters, and Emma's complacency about living inside the walls, so to speak. Which Attack on Titan definitely has lots to say on. But perhaps more accurate still is to compare this to Shinsei Kaiori, where a group of highly brain-powered kids aren't allowed to go outside the small area they were raised in because the adults told them so. Like that's ever gonna work. Oh, what? It did? Okay, I don't think that's what realistically would happen, but okay, show. But actually, the most apt comparison is another Attack on Titan derivative, where a bunch of kids are being raised by vampires as a food source, and they must find a way to escape. Hopefully the monster villains in this show aren't as incompetent as episode 1 made them out to be. At least in Noari no Sura, the vampire noble's incompetence was on purpose. Here they just leave the gate open and there's no cameras or some kind of detector despite them having the technology to make screens and stuff. It's like the author didn't think this through. Which does suck because I wanted to see this concept done well. If these mysterious monsters do somehow get checkmated, because, you know, chess equals strategy for anything, and our super smart trio of main characters will surely be relying on their brains to strategize a plan that will allow them to escape from the evil monsters that want to eat them. Just check out the super strat that the Shun equivalent of the group Norman came up with. No! <gasps> Phew, that is some high level strategizing. Just take a look at all these characters that say so. They wouldn't be saying this if it wasn't true, obviously. Look at how well informed these kids are. They know their shit. Down to the basic traits written on the character stat sheets. It's almost as if they know the exact intentions of the author himself and are speaking from his mind directly, with zero ambiguity. And with that information, the social hierarchy is established. So you know all the other kids are just useless meat sacks. But hopefully for the sake of these kids, they won't become that. I guess human meat in this world is treated as a delicacy. And these kids are supposed to be like fine Kobe beef. I don't get how having higher intelligence is supposed to make these kids taste better. It's not like they only eat the brains. These kids are categorized based on their intelligence as different types. Is there any actual physical difference? Why did they have this plant sprout out of her? I'll continue watching so hopefully they answer these questions in a satisfying manner. But maybe I'll just read the manga because the visual direction of the anime is so bland. There was some direction to try to make some scenes feel like a horror, but they lacked the impact of something like Shinsekai Yori, which had thoughtful compositions to evoke feelings from the viewer, despite its lack of budget. In Yaksoku no Neverland, the visuals don't really say anything. You know, I have the most uninteresting symbolism, like, hey, did you know these guys are actually cattle? Look at these ID numbers on their necks. 
They had this giant clock that at first I thought was just for background decoration, but then it turns out it's to show how long they've been playing tag for. And you can't even see the minute hand clearly on this third showing of the clock, so like, what the fuck was the point of this? There's some tryhard shots where they had the camera follow the characters along as they're walking. I guess it looks neat, but the environment is so bland it doesn't add anything. It actually makes it look more wonky because the 3D background seems to be rendered at an out of sync frame rate with the character animation. There's a truck that seems to be made for normal sized people, but the monsters who are driving it are much bigger. Why don't they just make monster sized trucks? Haha. <laughs> Emma also notices there's liquid dripping from one of the pipes on the ceiling. Perhaps the same kind as the one their dead friend is being cased in. But that doesn't really add anything either. It doesn't enhance the mood of the scene at all. At best there may be some direction to show how big the world looks compared to these kids. But all that added space on top of their heads simply makes this world look even blander. Another part where I felt the direction was just plain bad was that they didn't even show the little girl's face before she was about to be victimized. They essentially dehumanize her before the edgy reveal scene, making the scene much less impactful. It's like they don't even want us to care. Which I doubt because they were really trying to lay it on thick with her being hapless and innocent. The character expressions that we did get to see were really just one note and boring. The only character that had any interesting expressions was Isabella. It seems like she's just trying to keep a happy face for the sake of her own sanity. How did she come to be working for these monsters anyways? What happened to the world in 2045 exactly? Where did they even get these kids from? But I guess they took them from somewhere at birth because they seemingly have no recollection about the outside world. But that doesn't excuse the characters from being so overtly planned. For a group of kids that supposedly grew up together isolated from the world, you'd figure they have their own unique ways of doing things and seeing things as well. But no, Paul, you get a stereotypical dialogue that could be put in any anime about wanting to visit other places. But the dialogue isn't the only thing that's generic, though. The characters all feel like they're being forced to play an archetypical role for the sake of fulfilling a trope. The author could have tailored a more specific and interesting character to challenge this setting, but instead he chose a typical shonen protagonist, except for being female, I guess. And you have the genius nice guy who's watching over the female protagonist, who's always smiling and his broody rival who's depressed because he can never beat him. Hopefully they do something interesting with these characters and they don't end up becoming Mary Sue's. And that's all I have to say on my initial impressions of Yaksoku no Neverland, a show that could use a lot of improvements. If you like this video, give it a boost by clicking on the like button and subscribe for more content. See ya!